Our reading today is from John 14, 27 to 31, and chapter 16, verse 33. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back for you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The word of the Lord. Children are free to head out to Children's Church if you would like to go there. So I'm guessing that you noticed both from the sermon title and from what uh, Barb just read for us that today we're going to talk about uh, the peace that is ours in Jesus Christ. So before we do, I need your assistance. Please remember, semi-deaf went up here. Um, For you, what does peace look like? Like, what's peace feel like? What's it look like? What's peace? No answer, no lunch. What's peace look like in your world? Calmness? Everything's calm. Everything's quiet. Yeah, Gail had peace last weekend. Steve was away. What's peace feel like? What's it look like? No conflict. Yeah, everybody's just nice. I like that. What else? Oh, I love the Sunday school answer. Thank you. Trusting God, being able to actually trust him. What else? Absence of worry. Mm-hmm. I would, absence of anxiety. These are all things I would love to experience someday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No war. That would be peace. Yeah. I don't know if for me peace has a, a real good definition in my world. It's so much as it's a feeling. Like if I am standing, um, I finally made it to the top of that mountain, or I found the lake that's just, like it's just perfect right next to the mountain, or you let me go to my favorite kind of beach, which is a beach where there are not other humans, right? It is not peaceful to me that I have to climb over you, listen to your music, and risk that you're going to hit me with your frisbee. That's not peace. But a beach where there are not people. I think because when I'm on top of the mountain or I'm next to that ocean, like I feel small. I feel like there's something much bigger out than me out there, and he's got this. Some of you, peace is like all of your loved ones are there and preferably speaking to each other, right? They're all gathered, we have not discussed politics, we're all happy at the same table. That's peace. Um, Some of us, my, Anne already said it, my definition of peace is no one's angry with anybody. Like, I can just move on with my day. That's peace. Think about our definitions of peace that we're, we're tossing out here, is that they're all temporary. Right? If if peace for me is my whole family is at the table, well, there's a million reasons why one day that might not be the case. Right? There can be a car accident such that prevents someone from ever coming to that table again. Or there's a fight because, you know, it does tend to happen in families where I'm not speaking to you anymore and we won't all come to the table. Or the reason we came to the table was because we loved and respected grandma and we buried her and now the family's never going to get together again, right? There's a million reasons. If your definition of peace is everybody, including me, is happy and healthy, all it takes is one diagnosis, and there is chaos from that moment forward, and there's no external or internal peace. If your definition of peace is contingent upon everything at my workplace goes smoothly, then you must work somewhere I don't. 
and that won't last very long. Anytime we try to nail our peace, that, that sense of I can rest, I'm okay, on something that's external, or for that matter, something that's internal, like I don't worry, then my peace comes and it goes. It can be robbed in a heartbeat. And I think that's why Jesus speaks here. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. And we talked last week about how Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit, who is our advocate. He fights us for us so that we grow up in our salvation, that we live in the light of our eternity. And I don't think it's a coincidence that literally the next sentence after saying, I'm going to give you my spirit, and he's going to cause you to know me. Next sentence, Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And I don't give you the way the world gives. Right? I don't give peace that comes and goes. It's fleeting. Uh, it's present if everything's okay. I give you peace that is not contingent on any circumstance. And Jesus says that's a peace that ought to change your lives. So the truth of the matter is, I as a Christian should be more peaceful when my world is in chaos than any non-Christian could ever imagine. Right? I'm not, but I should be. Now, that does not mean that I, as a Christian, when my world goes crazy, when something happens I didn't expect or don't want, it does not mean to have the peace of Jesus Christ that I feel nothing. Right? It doesn't mean I just say, oh, well, I'm not sad or disappointed or hurt or scared. That's not what peace is. Right? Peace isn't suddenly becoming a robot or having a frontal lobotomy. That's not peace. The peace that Jesus gives is the peace that says no matter what's happening outside or for that matter inside, I can rest in the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And he says that kind of peace is a peace that will make me no longer have a troubled heart. I'm not anxious and stressed about everything that's happening in my world because I've got an anchor for my soul. It is also something that makes me no longer afraid. Not that I'll never feel fear, but that I'll stop looking at the things around me, the circumstances, the situations, and say that thing's bigger or scarier or more real or more powerful than my God. Because his definition of peace isn't tied to circumstances. It's tied to truth. And as we walk through this passage here, John 14, and then the end of John 16, what we're going to discover is that Jesus' peace is really straightforward. It is knowing and then living in light of whose you are, who you are, and where you're going. So let's just walk through this together. My hope, by the way, is that not only will we come away today saying, okay, I know these truths, but that we will let these truths be the litmus test where I look at my life and say, do I live like this? Do I live more at peace, resting in these truths today than I did a year ago as the Holy Spirit keeps showing me who I am in Jesus Christ? So let's look at verse 28. Jesus says, and he's talking to the disciples, right? He says, you heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you, right? I'm going away, as in he was going to be crucified the very next day. But, he says, and they don't understand or believe, in three days I'm coming back. But he's also saying to them, and I'm really going to go away. Forty days after my resurrection, I'm going to ascend to heaven, and you're not going to see me, but one day I'm coming back. You heard me say, I'm going away, I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, then you would be glad that I am going to the Father. Because the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when this does happen, you will believe. I love this sentence. Are you going to picture it? Jesus is at this point still in the upper room. He's there with all the disciples, and they are sweating bullets. Because Jesus has said to them, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here any longer. Uh, the one who brought you to the table will no longer be here, and you need to still come to the table. And all they can think about is, what is life going to be like when he isn't here? And so Jesus looks at them and says, um, friends, you've forgotten something. It's good. It's good that I'm going. It's good for me that I'm going. I'm going to be with my father. Right? Jesus says, I'm going back to be with the one who I've been with since before eternity. 
the one who I have an intimate love relationship with forever. I'm going to be in his presence. This is good for me. It's good for all of humanity because it's the only way salvation ever comes. And you people are not glad. Matter of fact, they're grief-stricken. They are terrified. Do you know why? Because all the disciples have fallen under the same uh, syndrome that every human does. They think they're the center of the universe. Ever been there? Right? From where they sit, the only thing that matters is that if Jesus is leaving, it's going to impact me. When Jesus goes, this is how I'm going to get hurt. When Jesus leaves, this is what it's going to do in my world. I, I all of a sudden, you know, maybe um, Matthew is sitting there going, geez, I really struggle with Peter, and it's been great to have a buffer. And when Jesus is gone, I got to deal with him center of the universe. But Jesus looks at the disciples and he says to them, no, you can have peace even when I leave. You can have peace even though you're asking questions like, why? Why does he have to leave? Why does it have to be now? Why couldn't it be later? Because they're not the center of the universe. So when Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, you should be glad. You should be glad for me. He's laying out this incredible challenge that's really hard. It wrecks all of our worlds. He's saying to them, you're not the center of the universe. I am. You know, this sentence is a sentence that can bring incredible peace into each one of our lives. Even though at first glance, when someone says that to us, it normally rubs us wrong. You know, the only time my mom ever would say to me, Kelly, you're not the center of the universe, was basically when I was insisting she do the thing I wanted her to do and I was being not so subtly informed, it ain't about you. I don't like being told things aren't about me. I like being the center of the universe. I think the entire world should do the things I want them to do because it would be better. But I'm not. And that's a beautiful thing. Because if I am the center of the universe... One, I shouldn't be surprised by anything that happens in the world because I'm the center of it. I better know it's coming. If I'm the center of the universe, I'm responsible to fix anything and everything that is wrong in my universe because supposedly I'm in control of it. And I don't know about you, but I've yet to fix the things that make me lose my peace. If I'm the center of the universe, I'm owed an explanation. My why has to be answered. And if it isn't, or it isn't answered in a way that I want it answered, we have a problem. The entire Bible from beginning to end says one thing. You are not the center of the universe. The God who created it, the God who made it and formed it and put you in it, the God who delights in you, he's the center of the universe. And that's beautiful. Because if my God, who is good, is the center of his universe, then I can trust him. Because anything that happens in his universe, no matter how it impacts me, comes from one who is good. One who I can trust. One who knows the why, even if I don't. And one who has never and will never be surprised by anything that happens in my world because it's his world. It's his universe. And that means that anything that happens in my life, he promises to use for his good and his glory, because his universe is actually about him, not about me. Do you know how much power there is in that? Let me give you a for instance. Some of you have heard me say, I want to be Betty Norford when I grow up. Right? For those of you who do not know, Betty Norford is 92, uh, 91, and she's She's in her 90s. <laughs> Betty uh, was, is a retired pastor, and that woman knows and trusts Jesus in a way I hope to when I am her age. And uh, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar, Betty was uh, in the hospital, COVID, very, very, very bad COVID, uh, and then in rehab and is now home, and she's recovering. Uh, but both when I was with Betty in the hospital and when I was with Betty in the rehab, uh, she said to me both times, both times through tears, though I think she can only remember one time, um, crying, 
and said, I don't understand. Two and a half years, two and a half years, I avoided COVID. Two and a half years, I cut off contact with half my family. Two and a half years, I managed to avoid this. And here I am, three weeks before I'm supposed to go preach on the pride of the Susquehanna, which, if you know Betty, you know that she lives for that day. She plans the whole year for that day because she's going to preach. She's going to preach the gospel. Three weeks before going, she's in the hospital. The day she's supposed to be there, she's in the rehab and she can't even get out of bed. And Betty's telling me, pouring her heart out, crying, I don't get this. And the next sentence, but I know that God is good. And I don't have to understand why he let this happen. I know God's still going to get glory from this. And that's why at 2 o'clock in the morning when the nurse's aide came into her room, Betty said, how are you doing? And when the nurse's aide said, not great, Betty told the nurse's aide about Jesus Christ. Because she had peace. When you know who you belong to, you are not the center of the universe. You belong to the one who is good and great and mighty and perfect. Then you can say through tears, I'm disappointed and I am sad, and I don't get this, and I still have peace because I know who is the center of the universe. Does that make sense? So let's talk about the next one. The next one uh, is the one that gets me. Jesus says in verse 30 to the disciples, I'm not going to speak with you much longer because the prince of this world is coming. Who's the prince of this world? Satan, yes. Yeah. Someone last week said Jesus. That would be a no. It is Satan, right? Satan is the prince of this world. So Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, I can't talk to you. And he means that, like, literally, this conversation is going to come to an end because Satan is coming. Now, Satan himself did not show up that day. People did. And it wasn't very long afterward, uh, after that little interaction, that Judas shows up and he betrays Jesus. And he brings with him Roman soldiers who arrest Jesus. And a whole bunch of people come together and they accuse Jesus. And Peter, later that night, is going to deny Jesus. And by the next morning, Jesus is crucified, hanging on a cross. And every person there, all of his disciples, his mother, every single person looking in that moment had to have had only one thought. Satan gets the last word. That's what it looked like. It looked like Satan won. But the very next morning, every lie that could be spoken about Jesus had been, and it looks like God's plan thwarted. It stopped. It was over. Satan got the last word. So what does Jesus say? Look at verse 30. I can't speak with you much longer. The prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. None. The phrase here is a, is a Hebrew idiom taken from the court system. And just like in English, our idioms don't translate very well, so we did the best that we can here. But in a Hebrew court, it means something along the lines of that person can't make an accusation. They have nothing against me. They, they, they've got no case. So Jesus looks at the disciples and it's like he's telling them, you've got to catch this. Tomorrow morning, it's going to look like Satan won. Satan can't make a single accusation against me that will stick. Because in Jesus' case, there is no accusation that can stick. None. You've got to hear this. Because Jesus goes on and he says, here's why I'm going to the cross tomorrow. It's not because Satan wins. It's not because I owe Satan. I am going to the cross tomorrow so the whole world can see that I listen and obey and trust my Father. I'm going to the cross so that the will of God is accomplished. I'm going so Satan can't have the final word. If Satan had had his way, and the final word would have been, Jesus is dead. Peter's a denier. The, the guys that crucified him are nothing more than murderers. If, excuse me, if Satan had had the final word, 
then every single person there would have been defined by their sin and only their sin for all of eternity. You see, but you know the rest of the story. And you know that on the third day, Jesus is very, very, very much alive. And you know that if even Judas had come to Jesus and confessed his sin and placed his faith in him, the final word about Judas would not be that he was a betrayer, it would be that he was the beloved of God himself. Sometimes you and I lose our peace. Sometimes we lose it because we think we're the center of the universe and we're ticked off that something happened that we didn't want in our universe, only it's not ours. Sometimes we lose our peace because we forget who we are. We think Satan gets the final word. That Satan gets to uh, destroy some part of our life or he gets to declare who we are. So we lose our peace when in our own minds all we can hear is Satan making accusation. And he has plenty of a case against you and me. He's got none against the one who you are in. Sometimes we lose our peace because some other person says something about us and it irritates us, generally because what they said has a grain of truth. And so we act like Satan gets the final word. Satan doesn't get to define who you are. Only Jesus Christ does. You know, there's something amazing. There's incredible peace that comes when someone speaks about me, and it's true. And I get to take a breath and say, and it doesn't define me because I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And if they name sin that's real in my life, I can confess it and give it to Jesus because he gets to tell me who I am. Jesus' peace comes when you know you're not the sinner. Satan doesn't get the final word. Here's the last thing. Very final verse, chapter 16. Jesus says, I have told you all these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. We're going to talk in a couple of weeks. Jesus gives us a, a really gracious warning here. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, we'll talk in a couple of weeks about why that's an incredible gift. It, it, it speaks against a world that wants to say, well, if I, if I pray enough, read my Bible enough, go to church enough, then everything will be perfect. Jesus says, no, if you live in this world, there will be trouble, there will be pain, there will be hurt. But in him, there will be peace. Because he has overcome this world. The truth is, if this world was all that there was, if this life that you live is as good as it's ever going to get, then when something goes wrong, that's a catastrophe. And if this life is as good as it ever gets and your health fails, then you have every reason to be terrified because from here it's downward forever. If this life is as good as it ever gets, then anything that goes wrong should put you in a tailspin. But what Jesus promises here is this incredible truth. He said, I overcame this world. I've defeated it. The, the war is, in fact, won. Because one day he's going to return and create a new world that is perfect. And that's why for a Christian, we have peace. This life is not as good as it ever will get. Actually, this life is as bad as it's ever going to get. And that's going to mean at least two things. One, it means that an awful lot of the stuff that you and I lose our peace about, we get upset about, we get irritated about, we gossip about. If we stop for one whole second and said, will this thing matter five years from now? There's a lot of stuff I lose my peace over. I'm not even going to remember it happened five years from now. I won't remember it happened five months from now. And if I can look and know where I'm headed to, that there's an eternity, there's a lot of things maybe I need to deal with or address, but I probably don't need to lose my peace over. There are some things, though, I don't care if it's five or 50 years from now, I'll remember, and it's still going to hurt. There are some pieces of this life, this world, where there is trouble, 
that there's no releasing, there's no getting over, at best we get through. And you got to remember this, that you have this incredible invitation to bring those things that really hurt to the Savior who's walked this world, to the one who knows that pain, the one who will weep with you today, but has done everything needed to conquer this world so that one day you know perfect peace in his presence. The more you and I well, do what we talked about at the very beginning of the service, the more you and I feel anxious and fearful and yet see Jesus saying, I want to give you my peace right now, this moment, this second, this situation. The more we reach back to him and say, okay, Lord, I'm, show me that I'm not the center of the universe because I'm sure acting like it right now, that you are and I can trust you. And then we live that. The more that you and I look at our God and say, I'm acting like Satan gets the final word. He gets to define, uh, he gets to destroy. And you say, Jesus, I'm gonna grab your hand, tell me who I am, and then let me live that. And the more that we hold true to where we're going, that's where peace comes. We do still live in this world. Peace is fleeting. It comes and it goes. I feel it and I don't. And yet I get to hold on to truth because he doesn't go. As the band's coming forward, we're going to prepare to sing, It is well with my soul. And you know what? It is well. When peace like a river attends my way and when sorrows like sea billows roll. It is well with my soul because this is still true. As we're preparing, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I invite you in this time of prayer, if you need to come and ask Jesus to be your peace, ask him. If you need to come and say, Jesus, I have to confess before you, I don't live this way. I live like I'm the center of the world. Then confess it, that he might bring you peace. Let's come before him in prayer. Jesus, I pray for each one of us today that more and more we would know a peace that passes understanding, the peace that serves as armored guards around our hearts when life is not at all how we expected, the peace that Paul says rules over relationships between brothers and sisters, that more and more we would know that peace because every day we would hear that invitation to trust, to believe. For each one of us, Lord, stepping in to peace, resting in who you are, whose we are, where we're going, is a very concrete and real, and it requires every day a new step. Today, as you extend your hand to us, may we say yes. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. And to all God's people said,